Have you ever heard of the horror movie cycle? The basis of it is that when a horror film exceeds expectations and becomes insanely popular, studios attempt to capitalize on that and flood the market with films that fit this, we'll say, subgenre. In the 80s, slashers dominated the horror genre. Once Jason, Freddy, and Michael showed signs of losing their grip on the box office, teen horror films began to emerge in the 90s, with movies like Scream, I Know What You Did Last Summer, and The Craft. The 90s closed out with The Blair Witch Project, <laughs> which spawned a whole subgenre of found footage horror that's still popular today. You get the idea. There's a cycle that has been taking place in the horror genre for decades. This wasn't necessarily the case in the 1970s, where the most popular films of that decade seemed to run the genre gamut. You had monster flicks, zombie flicks, sci-fi, you name it. In the middle of 1975, production began on one of the most popular entries in the history of horror films, The Omen, a film that would tackle the supernatural horror film in a way that had not been done before. On the sixth day of the sixth month of 1976, Surely those numbers must have some significance. Audiences were introduced to The Omen, the story of a young boy named Damien, the Antichrist, and the family that raised him. Audiences delighted in the chaos that would occur whenever the spawn of Satan appeared on screen, and horrific accidents seemed to occur. But what audiences didn't see in the film is the horror that took place during production. Horror that seemed to occur on a regular basis, just like in the film. Horror that has since been attributed to some kind of spiritual curse just like in the film, and accidents that seem to actually mirror some of the horrors on screen. Horrors so real that they really deserve their own film in the genre. Seriously, why has that not happened? Quick disclaimer though, if we believed in superstition in any way, shape, or form, we definitely wouldn't be touching this one. Thankfully, we don't, because honest to God, When you dig through one of your favorite director's filmographies, you're reminded of just how great that person is at their craft. Richard Donner is certainly no exception. The man gave us some of our best memories from the 80s with films like The Goonies, Scrooged, and Lethal Weapon. In the 90s, he had settled into the career, doing projects with his favorite actors like Mel Gibson, in films like Maverick, Conspiracy Theory, and a couple more Lethal Weapons. Back in the 70s, Donner solidified his career by bringing the most wholesome of heroes to life in Superman the Movie and Superman 2. But it was just before Superman that Donner decided to tackle the horror genre. The Omen was almost certainly born out of the sociological climate of the early 70s. It was a time when the peace, love, and feel-good vibes of the 60s were quickly replaced with paranoid feelings post-Vietnam and Watergate. The general public mindset of no one is out to get you quickly switched to they really are out to get us and we won't realize it until it's too late. Films like Three Days of the Condor and The Conversation really started to reflect that paranoia to mass audiences. Following on the heels of the Manson arrest and trial, supernatural horrors like The Exorcist found great success, coupling that feeling of constant dread with the fears of the religious unknown. You would think that a film like The Omen would be born out of that paranoia, but the idea came to a Christian businessman named Bob Munger. He felt that the world would be terrified if they knew the Antichrist that the Bible described really existed. But what if the Antichrist was just a young boy who wouldn't grow into the Satan we see in Revelation for some time? With this idea, Munger didn't want to create a successful franchise. He didn't want to relaunch the career of an actor who had semi-retired. He just wanted to scare people. He wanted to scare the hell out of them. Munger soon met with producer Harvey Bernhard and shared his idea. And the plot that was born from that idea was simple. A family adopts a child. Sweet. But of course, that's not what it seems to be. The child that's adopted just happens to be the Antichrist. You're kidding, what a crazy random happenstance. The film was actually originally called Antichrist but the title was later changed to The Birthmark, and eventually became The Omen. After completion of the script, the film started to take off quickly. While some actors, such as Charlton Heston, William Holden, and Roy Scheider, turned down the role, Gregory Peck, one of Hollywood's most popular actors at the time, expressed interest in it. To have such an actor on board gave the film weight and credibility that none of the producers had planned for. Peck signed on and the wheels were in motion. The Omen very quickly became a runaway train. Nothing could stop it at this point. Not that Bob Munger didn't try. Munger, who was now signed on as the religious advisor to the film, insisted on a meeting with the producers just before production began. The purpose of the meeting was to warn producers of what was to come. Munger had a belief about the Antichrist that you've probably heard before. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. 
If Satan wanted to convince the world that he wasn't real, and a film was going to be shown worldwide about him and his doings, Munger felt that everyone should be made aware of what could happen. And yet, everyone moved on unfazed by the possibility of the supposed satanic retribution that might come their way. Three months before filming began, a horrible tragedy struck as Gregory Peck's son committed suicide. No one could possibly explain what a tragedy like that would do to a father. No one could possibly know what was going through Peck's mind in the months after. But what we do know is that while he was devastated, Peck's agent convinced him to continue working so that the grief wouldn't consume him. In September of 1975, Peck boarded his plane for London, and somewhere over the Atlantic, his plane was struck by lightning. Let's stop here for a second. This isn't actually that uncommon. Planes get struck by lightning fairly often. So by no means are we saying, look at yet another horrible thing that happened. In fact, statistically, every commercial airliner is struck by lightning about once a year. It's not exactly normal, but it's not exactly odd either. What is odd is the fact that it happened to Gregory Peck's flight to London. Then it happened again to producer Mace Newfeld's flight to London. And it was rumored to have happened to writer David Seltzer's flight as well. So definitely two, maybe three flights from LA to London possibly all three planes struck by lightning. That's not coincidence. While most of the casting was complete at this point, the child who would play Damien himself had not yet been hired. Donner wanted to go with the child who didn't have a background in acting, so they decided to hold off on that role until they arrived in London. Once the production crew finally landed, casting calls were underway at schools in the city. Not long after, a blonde, green-eyed cockney kid named Harvey Stevens read for the part. Producers were impressed, but Donner wasn't convinced. He wanted to see the ferocity that the boy needed to possess. So they had Stevens rehearse the church wedding scene. You know the one. As Damien slowly approaches a church, he becomes more agitated and violent, eventually fighting with his own father, refusing to go into the house of God. When Stevens rehearsed the scene with Donner, he kicked the director right square in the nuts, which is honestly what earned him the part. His hair was straightened and dyed black, and the son of Satan himself was now on board. The first shots Donner wanted for the film were aerial establishing shots around London. The crew had rented a charter flight, but the airline called them back not long after, claiming they had a better rental deal for the day. They would have to cancel the production's flight, but offered a discount for a later date. The day the flight was scheduled to take off with production crew, it instead took off with its new passengers. On takeoff, it flew through a flock of birds that damaged the engines. The plane crashed not far from the runway, colliding with a station wagon. Six people died. And if it weren't for the last minute change in plans, members of the crew, including Donner himself, would have been among those that perished. In October of 1975, production with the crew was underway. As everyone had some time to move past the travel issues and the doomed flight that they barely avoided, the next challenge met the crew head on in the form of Rottweilers. Earning the title of Devil Dogs on set, the Rottweilers shocked members of the crew with just how vicious they could be in scene rehearsals. In fact, one look at what they could do convinced stuntman Terry Walsh that the gear he was given to protect himself from bites wasn't going to be enough. He was provided with felt, extra padding, even stainless steel. And it wasn't enough. Soon after action was called, it was clear that he didn't have enough protection, as the dogs bit through everything right down to Walsh's arm. After cutting, it was apparently still difficult to get one of the dogs to even let go, and Walsh passed out from the shock and pain. That was the first animal attack. Oh yes, just the first. Scenes were shot in a safari park for the film, where animals needed to react to the Antichrist being among them. In one scene, at the advice of the park warden, a young baboon was tranquilized and put in the back of the car to elicit a reaction from the other baboons. Baboons, being a very family-oriented species, reacted as you would expect, and it was all caught on camera. Both actors were terrified from the ordeal, but Lee Remick especially was traumatized. She's often said in interviews following the film that her face, her screams, and her reaction overall were completely authentic, because she was trapped and terror-stricken. And that's not all, there was a third animal attack. It was a scene that was shot in the Big Cats exhibit of the Safari Park, that never made it into the final cut of the film. There was an animal keeper that was on hand to assist with the filming of the Big Cats the entire day, and the scene ended without incident. But the following day, hours after the production crew had left, that animal keeper was attacked and killed by one of the tigers. At this point, the crew had a very keen idea of what was happening, and rumors of a curse because of the film's subject matter made its way around the production. Producer Mace Newfeld was aware of the rumors, but by and large he wouldn't allow himself to be impacted by them, even after the lightning strike. Then this supposed curse started chasing him down again. The lobby of the Hilton Hotel in London was bombed, killing two people and injuring 63. This Hilton just happened to be where Newfeld was staying during the production, but it just missed him. 
He left the hotel with his wife minutes before. He didn't get that far from the blast and claimed that he and his wife could hear the roar when it happened. She thought it was an earthquake. What else would people from LA think? But Neufeld knew it was a bomb. But again, just like the lightning strike, this wasn't that uncommon. Yes, bombings aren't like thunderstorms, but at the time, the IRA was bombing multiple locations in London. One of those locations just happened to be the hotel where the film's producer was staying. That on its own could be a coincidence, but you have to take into account the second bombing. Everyone on set was feeling the tension and the pressure of this production, including the producers and even Donner himself. In an attempt to put everyone's mind at ease, Gregory Peck invited the director and producers to his favorite spot in the city, a seafood restaurant called Scott's Oyster Bar. On November 12th, after reservations were made, members of the party headed to Scott's when, boom, it happened again. The restaurant was blown up just minutes before Peck's party arrived. Again, they could have all been coincidences, but again, members of the crew for the Omen narrowly avoided disaster and mortality. Despite all of the disasters, Donner himself forbade anyone to discuss the possibility of a curse on set. But it couldn't be avoided. Whispering continued throughout the shooting schedule. And just like Donner couldn't control the whispers, he couldn't control the overall belief that something was wrong. This became apparent when Lee Remick refused to shoot the balcony fall as it was planned. Though Donner tried his best to convince her that everything would be safe, Remick wasn't having it. Instead of showing Remick plummeting to her death from the upper floor, the shot was instead changed to a bowl of water slowly falling, then cut to Remick struggling to hang on for her life. Donner actually had to rewrite the script based on fears among the crew. He had to rework how that scene would be shot. He also eventually had to change the film's ending. The original cut of the film had the father killing Damien, a scene that Gregory Peck was none too thrilled about shooting less than a year after his own son's death. It was rewritten and reworked so many different ways that the film was set to end with a shot of three caskets, one for the mother, one for the father, and one for Damien. After viewing the original cut, the studio asked for an ending where Damien could live, so that the film could possibly cash in on sequels in the future. Donner eventually reshot the ending, but had a little fun with it that time around. As the audience sees two caskets, the camera tilts down to Damien, who turns and looks right at the audience to close out the film. During this shot, Donner started yelling, Don't you dare laugh, Harvey! Which, of course, caused the young boy to laugh giving audiences one of the creepiest smiles in movie history. So finally, the picture was complete. The crew made it back safely to LA, and The Omen was released to tremendous success. With the help of a $2 million marketing campaign, the same price tag as the budget for the film, The Omen grossed $4 million on its opening weekend, and went on to gross over $60 million in total. It holds an 86% on Rotten Tomatoes and has earned its place as one of the scariest films ever made on many lists, including the Chicago Film Critics Association and the American Film Institute. Perhaps the highlight of all the accolades the film has received is its memorable score. The film's composer, Jerry Goldsmith, utilized pioneering, bone-chilling Gregorian chants and changed the course of horror movie soundtracks forever, and subsequently won him his only Oscar for Best Original Score. The film spawned, no pun intended, two sequels, a remake in 2006, and a television series. After all of that, the actors moved on to other projects. Donner specifically focused on happier ones. Hey, you guys! <laughs> and the omen went down in horror and film history. That should be it, but the supposed curse of the omen didn't end there. Perhaps the most horrific scene in the entire film came from stunt coordinator John Richardson in the form of a decapitation. The desired effect of the scene was to use five cameras, then cut between the footage from each to lengthen the incident itself. Frightened moviegoers who covered their faces would be tricked into lowering their fingers from their eyes, and they would still catch the gruesome shot whether they wanted to or not, and that shot would haunt them long after the film was over. As it turns out, that shot would haunt Richardson as well. Twelve months after the stunt was shot, Richardson was in Holland working on his next picture, A Bridge Too Far. Late one night, he was driving with his assistant, Liz Moore and was involved in a head-on crash, and the front wheel of the vehicle came up through the car and decapitated Moore. Richardson was knocked out from the accident. When he came to, he claims the very first thing he saw was a mile marker sign, saying that the town of Omen was 66.6 kilometers away. Ultimately, the film never gives a concrete answer as to whether or not Damien is the Antichrist, though it's heavily insinuated, and of course he was. Audiences were meant to make up their own minds about the events that took place, which were either the work of an all-consuming evil, or merely coincidences. As it turns out, the crew left the production of The Omen having to make up their own minds about what they had witnessed as well. 